because the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. Lab Coat Nation, today's guest does not need an introduction, but I'm going to give him one. Many of you are very familiar with our guest today because he is the former CEO of Keller Williams, among many other duties and roles that he carried with the KW organization. He is the current president of Ojo Labs, which we I think we'll talk a little bit about today. He is an advisor to many real estate and tech companies. He's an author of a book called Dominant Thoughts, which we certainly are going to discuss today. And honestly, I could probably go on and on. I could fill this entire show with just the accolades and, and the things that you've done in this industry. Welcome to the show, Chris Heller. Thanks, Jeff. I, I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's, it. I was talking to someone yesterday and this is my 40th anniversary since getting my real estate license. So I got in 1983. And so if it was a wedding anniversary, this would be my Ruby, my Ruby anniversary. So yeah, I've, I've had a little time to do some of those things that you just mentioned. And, and like I said, I, I left out a lot because there is a lot because you've done a lot. And, and so, you know, in, in your words, better than mine, Tell us a little bit about that that upbringing in the business and kind of what led you to where you are today. Yeah, I actually, um, I, I was talked into getting into real estate. Um, I was talked into getting my license. My dad called me um, during my sophomore year in college and said, hey, you're going to get your real estate license and come and work uh, at this timeshare resort in Lake Tahoe as for a summer job to make some money. Um, and I said, okay which was unusual because I normally didn't say, okay, when my dad asked me to do things, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> so that's how I got my license and then um, moved to San Diego. And uh, again, still going to school part-time. So on time, there's a meta real estate broker who happened to come into this, this resort. And, um, and for the next three years, he recruited me to get into real estate, he kept sending me handwritten notes and calling me. And every time I saw him, um, he was just very persistent and consistent. And finally, he caught me at a weak moment. And I said, "All right, I'll I'll give it a try." And uh, that was in that was in November. I decided I, I told him if I'm going to get into real estate, I'm I'm not going to sell houses. That you know, if I'm going to do it, I want to do big stuff. And so now, granted, I knew nothing about selling houses or anything else. Um, so after about 30 days of of having no clue what a commercial real estate was or how to do it or anything else. I um, retired from commercial real estate, started in residential. And then um, you know, that year sold 27 homes and was rookie of the year in San Diego and, and then just kept going and growing. Wow. So what, uh, you know, what was the the path from there though? Obviously you, you stayed in real estate for a long time, but. Uh... Yeah. So for, um, so I, 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 created a recipe that worked for me and to be able to, to grow my business each year and to, you know, achieve my goals. And it was to create a, 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 a lot of discipline around a, a, a simple thing. And the simple thing was having and following a schedule. And the more discipline I got with that and the more effective I got with that, the more I was able to accomplish. Uh, everything else was in my schedule. So my you know, all my appointments I needed to go on, all the calls I needed to make, my prospect, my leisure, all, all that was in my schedule, but I focused on, if I followed my schedule, all those things would get done. And by doing that, I got very efficient, and very effective at what I was doing. And as my business grew, that, back then there was no concept of teams, right? No, it, it didn't exist. Um, so starting a team or building a team wasn't even like, uh, didn't, you know, that, that just like the internet, it didn't exist back, back then. So, but what I realized was after my first year uh, that I couldn't work anymore. I couldn't work any longer. I couldn't work any harder 
So the only solution was to hire someone to do some of the things I was doing to free me up to go sell more homes. So I hired my first admin assistant and then, then realizing that I had all these buyers that took a lot of time. And so I hired a showing assistant and, and without knowing it, a team was, was forming and growing. Uh, that team still exists in San Diego. It's 34 years this year that that team has existed. And uh, along the way, I kept getting more proficient. I've, um, in 2004, had after 16 years with one brokerage, switched to another brokerage, uh, which was Keller Williams at that time. And uh, five years later, I was the number one Keller Williams agent in the world. Um, they had reached out to me the previous year and said, hey, we have, we planned for a long time to expand Keller Williams globally. And we'd like to talk to you about being the one to help us do that. And they, um, you know, I had a couple of years of, of preparing for that. In 2010, I stepped out of the day-to-day -day of my team and took on the role as the president of this inter new international division and spent the next five years traveling the world and building Keller Williams globally and 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 um, kind of defied the odds of being able to do that successfully. No one, I didn't know how to do it. No one at Keller Williams knew how to do it. No one thought we could do it and, and we did it and we did it really well. Um, and that then created the opportunity for me to uh, then become the CEO of the company. Um, and, you know, after let's see, thir 13, 14 years at Keller Williams, I, had, I finally left, um, really wasn't sure what I wanted to do next, um, but met another billionaire founder, you know, self-made billionaire and who um, said, hey, I, I got to figure out how to get you to help me in my company and help me build a company. And so I joined Anthony Shea at Loan Depot and became the CEO of a, the sister company, Mellow Home. And all along, I'd been very involved in technology in our industry um, from trying to build my own all-in-one system in, in, in 1999, 2000, um, to uh, you know needing to figure out how to deploy things globally for Keller Williams and then, then you know, in, in North America. And that, that led me to meet a lot of technology people, a lot of technology company. I um, started advising some of them, became an advisor, became early investors. Ojo was one of those companies. Um, they asked me to ultimately be on their board and, and I did. And then in 2019, they said, hey, we could really use you full time. We could really use your help where things are going pretty well and we're growing fast. Uh, and at the time at Loan Depot, the mortgage industry and, in, in, um, this was, um, you know, end of 2018, beginning of 2019 was really in a tough spot. It's kind of like it is today. And um, it was like, all right, maybe this would be, be more fun and exciting to, to help a startup. So that's, that's, the, that's the progression of, of how things have happened. So let, let me ask you a question, go, just kind of going back to some of the things that you said, because it's a lot to unpack. And I do want to focus because you have so much to offer. I, I do want to focus on, you know, where we are, where we're going and those sort of things, mindset, obviously your book, but as the number one Keller Williams agent in the world, and you were doing that by the way, when Keller Williams was really dominant in the industry. Um, yeah. not quite as much today as they were probably five, six years ago. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and you just decided to leave like, <laughs> uh, uh, why, like, why on earth would you do that? I'm sure you were making as much money as anyone in real estate. You probably had the systems and the processes and everything just flowing and rolling and you were good crush. You're, you're probably Gary Keller's best buddy at this point. Yeah. And you just decided um, to leave. Yeah, well, so and I, Jeff, I I assume you're asking why I leave the agent ranks to get into a, an executive role. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, number one, number one, okay. yes. And then why did I leave the company all together? Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll answer both. Um, I never had a goal to become an executive or or to play a big role in the industry. I never had a specific goal of that. I always had a, the feeling that everything I was doing was preparing me for something else and something bigger. Um, I, I, need, I need challenges and the bigger the challenge, um, the, the better. And when they came to me and said, hey, 
you know, we want, we want, we think you can be the one to take this company globally. And I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea how to do it. No, no idea if we could do it, but it was, it was this close to so close to impossible that it was like, okay, that's the type of challenge I like. And, um, and so I, I took that now. I also took it with the idea that I was going to keep my business going and keep my agent business going and, you know, the Heller, the home seller team in San Diego, which I've done. So it wasn't, yes, I left the day-to-day -day of it and I left making a great living, uh, you know, seven figure income and selling houses and, and, and then took on a, an executive role for a fraction of that, that, but again, eventually it grew and got better. Um, to do something that was really hard and really I hadn't done before, but it was, it was that, it was like to do something new. After seven years um, working side by side and, and right with Gary, you know, meeting multiple times a week, um, it got to the point where there was some, how do I say this? There were some difference of opinions and there were some dynamics, not with Gary, but with some of the, board members and executives that put me in a situation where it felt like a, a no-win situation. And, and, I, and I knew it wasn't going to get any better. And I decided to make a really tough decision. And that was to, to stay in it or to go. And it wasn't workable to stay in it. And, and it was the right decision. And, and, and although I didn't know what I was going to do and really had no plan, um, in fact, I forced myself not to not to have a plan and not to know what I was going to do and to see what showed up. Um, and that was hard because it was the first time in my life where I didn't wake up every day knowing and going to bed every night knowing what exactly I was doing the next day and what I was building and what I was focused on. This is the first time in my adult life that I woke up and that wasn't the case. And when I went to bed every night, it was like, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And um but that was a really good exercise to force myself to go through. And it, you know, we, we, we always, we've heard, all know the phrase and heard the phrase, you know, when one door closes, several more open. Um, I, I lived that. I saw that happen. And, and, and what most people don't understand is it's not when one door closes, another one opens. When one door closes, many doors open. And the biggest challenge is not if you're going to find something or, or, um, Will there be good things or opportunities? It's it's choosing the right ones and and knowing how to do this. It's awesome. Uh, just one more question uh, that that um, I'm curious about. Maybe no one else is, but just because I'm pretty neutral to the industry, I can usually ask the, the, these questions. Yeah. As as much of an influencer as you are in this space, why have you never considered, or why didn't you go to like an EXP type model? That's you know obviously you would obviously it would work very very well for you. Yeah. So. Um, I th I actually had thought about had multiple meetings with Glenn and, and looked at that um, when I decided when I was decided to go to to Lone Depot and build Mellow Home, which which was a lot of things. One of which was a, a referral network where we were dealing with agents from all companies and all brands. I felt it was better. Um, for me to 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 maintain neutrality and to to sort of be Switzerland, it 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 seemed weird to me to to be building a network of agents, but then also at the same time be building you know my my network in in a company, yeah. Um, and in and, and I I don't do well like halfway in or halfway out, so I'm an all in type of guy. And then when I joined Ojo, it was the same thing. There, I, I, I'll say this. At the time, if all I was focused on was my real estate business, my real estate team, and I was making a change from, from the brokerage I had been at for 13 or 14 years to something else, um, at that time, EXP would have been the choice. Hmm. At, that time, at, at that time, I, I believe they had the the best model um, and, and the most lucrative model for, you know, top producing teams. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, and now we're talking about two of the most dominant real estate franchises over the last 10 years, I would say. Yeah. Um, and so it's fascinating. I'm just curious because you're, uh, for those listening again, you know, it's not often you get to, you get, we get to interview people like Chris and, and um, you know, it's fun to ask those questions because you are a unicorn uh, and, and whether or not you, you look at yourself that way you are, and, and you always will be, and your legacy will, will go on forever. So you continued out of real estate, which it makes sense. You know, I understand now with your association, not only with Ojo, but other platforms also that obviously real estate is their primary or one of their primary targets, but it then led you to write a book. Yeah. So tell us about that. Yeah, I had, um, I had thought about many times and had been asked many times. And I was doing a podcast like this and the host had me and a couple other guests on. One of the other guests was uh, a guy named Greg Reed, who's on the cover of my book as a co-author. And Greg has written 40, 50 books. And near the end of the, the conversation, the, get the, the host said, hey, Chris, I've known you a long time. You have so much to offer. When are you going to write a book? And I said, ah, yes, I thought about it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I'm ready yet. And besides, I don't know how. I've never done one. I'd have to pick Greg's brain on how to do that. Two days later, I get my phone rings and it's Greg Reed calling me and said, hey, it was great being on that podcast with you. That was a lot of fun. Um, you mentioned about writing a book. He goes, I have a title. I have the URL and I know how to do it. If you have the content, I'll show you how to do it. I'll con I have all the connections, the publishers, the, the artists to do the cover. The I, I know the play. I know the playbook. Um, if, if you have the content, I'll show you how to do it. We can have a book, and you just put me on as a co-author. And I said, deal. Um, so then the next the next decision was, okay, what kind of book? How's it? You know, what's going to be? Well, look at my strengths have have all uh, have been a lot of areas but one of the primary areas has been around mindset and and developing discipline and being able to be highly productive and and to be able to get stuff done and i thought back to some of the books that i've read and i've read a lot of books and still read a lot of books but early in my career there were several books that really stuck out and one of them uh, a couple of them were like you know the richest man in babylon or Og Mandito is the greatest salesman in the world. And those books were written in the form of like a, a business parable and a you know, short story. So I thought those are so impactful to me. And like some of the core things in me came from some of those stories that if I could write something that even had that impact on one person or on my four kids, uh, which was definitely in my mind, um, then, then that's what I want to do. So it's a short story about a mentor and a mentee, which is kind of ironic because I had a mentor helping me write the book about a mentor and a mentee. And so tell us about it. So you came up with the title, Dominant Thoughts. Uh, what's it about? So you know, when he asked me, hey, do you have the content? My immediate answer was yes. He goes, well, how, how, do, you, how do you say that so quickly that you have the content? I said, I've had a, a couple of lists that I've kept for years. And yeah, one, I think one was entitled um, My Rules for Living. And the other one was like My Rules for Winning. And they were pretty similar lists, but just it's, they were, I just would make the entries into this of my journal of the things I'd learn, you know, like about showing up and about, you know, telling the truth and, and you know, not being attached to the outcome and all, all these different things. So I had, I had this long list of topics. So then it was, all right, well, let's, let's pick some of them. Let's make the book, you know, 10, 12 chapters. I'll pick 10 or 12 of them. And then, you know, weave each of those, weave one of those into each chapter. Um, and that was, that was how, how it all came together. Hmm. Okay. So go a little bit more granular for us. Dominant thoughts. I mean, I could go 35 different ways with that. Obviously, it probably ties back to real estate business. Give us more. Yeah. Um, I specifically didn't make it real estate specific uh, because I wanted it to appeal to, to anyone. In the back of my mind, I was writing it for every real estate team and every real estate agent getting started. Um, but 
the story didn't have anything to do with real estate, but the lessons are totally applicable to the real estate industry, the mortgage industry, or, or for the most part, any sales industry. Um, and dominant thoughts is, is really about, you know, what, what are we thinking about and how, how we think and how that affects our performance. So each of the, each of the chapters, um, uh, and I'll just give you some examples, like, um, not listening to our wants and don't wants. So there's a story and the story goes along, but the, the lesson of that chapter is not listening to your wants and don't wants. And where that came from was one of the things I did in my whole career is I, I did lead generation and lead follow-up every day that I worked for the 26 years that I was active, you know, in my, in my real estate business. I never missed a day. And one of the, one of the games I'd play in my mind to make sure I didn't, didn't miss a day or that I did what I needed to do every day was I didn't listen to my wants and don't wants. So like everyone else who's human, um, especially those of us that are prospecting daily and doing lead follow-up daily and pounding the phones and knocking on doors and all those other things, there were more days than not where the voice in my head would say, I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna make another call. I don't wanna make any calls. Um, I don't, I don't wanna talk to these people. or I want to go golfing with my buddies that are golfing today, or I want to go fishing with my brother and my other friends that are going fishing today. And the immediate thought that would come next is I don't listen to my wants and don't wants. Mm -hmm. I focus on what I need to do. And I had a goal and my goal was very big every year and very important to me. So important that the worst feeling that I could possibly have would be getting to the end of the year and then looking back and saying, you failed or you didn't achieve what you set out to achieve because, or you missed it by 20% because 20% of the time you didn't do what you should have been doing. Like that, that type of feeling was like so gross to me that I wouldn't allow that to happen. So when the thoughts came up of, hey, I wanna go to the beach or I wanna go do this or I don't wanna do that. Like I don't listen to my wants and don't wants. I do what I need to do to achieve my goals. Now I knew if I achieved my goals, I'd have all the time and resources to do the things that I wanted, which is why I was doing what I was doing. Um, but you know, that's just one of those uh, one of those mindset things. Mm. Um, you know, another is uh, one that I that I used at a really high level and that we talked about in the book is you know not being attached to the outcome. I would see agents, loan officers, um, have have a deal, you know blow up at the last minute for whatever reason, for whatever fault. And they would be a mess. They would be emotional. They would be crushed. They would be out of the game. And, you know, and it would literally take them out of the game, like for days or weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'd look at them and go, I can't, I can't afford that. I can't afford to like be out of the game. Um, and so I started to realize that when you're attached, you do you do become emotional about it you become emotionally attached you know you feel it in your stomach your makes your head hurt all, all those emotions that happen and you grip very tightly and i really noticed it in negotiations like when the agent that i was negotiating with you know maybe wasn't selling a lot of homes and didn't and really needed a commission check because they had you know a house payment that was past due or credit cards that weren't paid or whatever i would see how they would act and they weren't acting in a way that was conducive to being a, a good negotiator. Um, sort of like in a, a poker game when someone you know, yeah. really needs to win, you know, their poker face is going to go right out the window. Um, so I trained myself not to be attached. Now, that sounds on one hand really easy and on the other hand, really hard. Like, how do you do that? Like, how we're all human, right? Um, what I did was I just changed my focus instead of being attached to being committed. And that, that little nuance helped me tremendously. So I was committed that if I was selling your home, Jeff, that, that we would get it sold and that you would go away happy and that we'd get your price. But I wasn't attached to it. So if it, something didn't happen, I wasn't going to be, you know, out of the game for three days or three weeks. Um, you know, I would go, all right, what did I learn? What do I need to do different next time? How am I going to get better? And on to the next. Um, 
And it didn't mean I didn't have feelings or, or anything. I cared deeply about every client I ever helped and, and every client that my team is helping today. Um, but being attached to it wouldn't serve my clients well. Being committed to helping them does. It's kind of like um, if you think about an emergency room physician, an ER physician, if they were attached to every patient they saw day and night, after three or four days, they'd probably be a wreck. They'd probably be ready to jump off the roof of the hospital. Um, they just, you can't get emotionally attached and emotionally involved that way. Now, great doctors are completely committed to every patient and helping every patient and, and doing everything they can for them. But there's a difference between, again, that commitment and that attachment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I've got I've got some follow up questions to it because. You know, I, I think I'm thinking to myself, and I'm sure there's the agent out there that's thinking to themselves, like, don't be not being attached to the outcome is easy for someone to say who has a massive pipeline of business because they don't rely on each and every deal because they can move on yeah. when you're either a getting started up or you're you're in the the world that we're in now, the the environment yeah. that we're in now, where listen, everybody's down and and you know we can. I don't need to give a specific example, but the each commission does matter. And so how for that agent, and I'm sure that's many of the ones listening, how do you unattach from the outcome when you need the damn money? Yeah. So look at most of the time I needed the damn money. And so don't get me wrong, uh, but here's what I knew for me to be as effective as possible and to be able to help people at the highest level that I had to be at a certain level. It's like, um, I went to a, I went to a, a, a minor league baseball game last night and whether it's minor leagues, major leagues, wherever it is, every time a baseball player goes up to bat, if he's thinking about the strikeout that he had at his last at bat and dwelling on that was embarrassing. I don't want that to happen again. I hope it, you know, what's the likelihood of a good outcome? Mm. It's not very high. Um, but if they didn't say, hey, what did I learn from that? What am I going to do different? And then his laser focus on the goal and the desired outcome has a much better chance of getting a hit. So it's one of those chicken and egg things. The more you're attached, the less the success you're going to have. And the less success you have, then the more you, you want to be attached. So it's a hard thing to break out of. One of my early mentors used to, when he talked to me about not being attached, he'd say, Chris, if you had 20 saleable listings, 20 motivated sellers, and 20 properties under contract right now, if you lost one, how would you feel? I wouldn't feel good, but you know, I'd be focusing on all the others and, and replacing it. He goes, all right, so if you only have one saleable listing, or one property under contract that falls out. How are you gonna feel? It's gonna feel horrible. So, all right, well then you have to act like you have 20 all the time. And that was a little, again, mm -hmm. mindset shift where I had to train myself to act that way. And I, and I created some, actually some rules for myself. I had what I call my three minute rule, which was I had three minutes to react. I had three minutes to get emotional. I had three minutes to be mad or to be sad or to be whatever it was. But after three minutes, my family, my business, my team, my clients were dependent on me. They were dependent, dependent on me to be in the game at the highest possible level. So I just wouldn't, wouldn't let myself go there. But okay, to your point, Jeff, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah, I'm saying it's super important. And it's yeah. one of the things that if you can build that muscle and build that discipline around it, um, you will be more effective. And the more effective you are, the easier it is, you know, to not be attached and to be focusing on on the commitments. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. Now, now, when it comes back to the, the, the wants and the unwants, and, and, you know, I mean, a lot of the reason why people got into real estate was because of those those you know factors it's i want flexibility i want the ability to make more money i don't want to work for anyone anymore 
And it's a result of those wants and unwants that is the reason why most real estate agents are very mediocre at best. It is, but I think it, it's because they don't fully connect all the dots. When the more disciplined I was with my schedule and the more structured I was, that would feel like um, it could be interpreted as being confining, constraining, not having the freedom. But what I quickly realized and, and witnessed around me is the more disciplined I was with my time, the more time I had. See, I would, I would be really disciplined, you know, from 7 a.m., you know, walking in the office at 7 a.m. And when I left at six or whatever time it was, I got more done in that amount of time than most agents would in two or three days. And I would see agents, some of which got there when I got there, but were still there at eight or nine at night because they weren't focused, they weren't disciplined, they didn't follow the schedule, and they were being reactionary or reactive all day long. And, and you know, being that pinball and that pinball machine that they had no control of what was going on. So for me, having more control over my time and my business equated to freedom because it gave me more time. Just like, you know, the, the more disciplined we are with our money, typically the more money we have, the more disciplined we are with our health, the better health we have. And time is, is that way too. So it's, it's kind of a paradox. And, and I, a lot of agents, including myself, yeah, I don't. I am horrible being told what to do or when to do, but I'm really good at saying, okay, here's what I need to do to be successful, or here's what I need to do to achieve the goals you want to do, and then laying out the plan and then doing what it takes to stick to it. Yeah. Or, or I was going to add one or be disciplined to social media and be disciplined to not letting it be a time suck versus creation and connection and all those sorts of things. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I, I got a question. It, you obviously as as a as a massive producer in the industry what was your best year ever units and volume um you, you, it wasn't that high this again back then um <laughs> when i started the top agents in the country were doing like 50 transactions like if you were doing 50 transactions in the 90s you were like you were on stage you were like how do they do that because they didn't uh, have teams back then yeah um so uh, when I stepped out of production, we were like 200 transactions uh, back then with, based on our average sales price, our volume was 130, 140 million, um, you know, that, that range. And we're, and my team is still about that range. Wow. But what I, what I did, um, there's two things I did. Number one, I focused on my profitability. So even in San Diego, for, for years, I was the number two agent in San Diego. But I netted almost three times as much as the number one agent. Hmm. And I know that because we worked for the same company. Um, and I wasn't in it for the ego. I was in it for the money. Um, the, and, and because of that, I, I, I was, okay, what do I have to do to maximize profitability and, and obviously be able to grow? But I was really focus on that monthly p l and keeping my expenses you know below a th certain threshold and then you know continue to grow beyond that so you mentioned you were massively disciplined and focused on lead gen what does that look like what did that look like for you then and what is the best advice you would give to an agent today in this world yeah yeah you know, it's interesting a lot has changed at the same time, a lot's kind of the same. Um, back then, and for any agent, even now, when you're first starting, you, you don't have a bunch of clients to, to be dealing with. You don't have a bunch of escrows to be managing. You don't have a bunch of anything to be doing other than working to get a bunch of clients and a bunch of escrows. So early on, I tried to focus and spent making sure that I was spending 70, 80% of my time on, on revenue generating activities. And as a new agent, that's a lot much easier to do, right? Because what else you got to do? I mean, yeah, you can spend 10% on training and learning and 10% and on meetings, and but 70% of it better be spent on revenue generating activities. So back then, again, early on, this is pre-internet. So it was knocking on doors, making phone calls, visiting for sale by owners, 
Hannah Marina expired, um, you know, working my sphere of influence and, and doing that all through handwritten notes, telephone calls and, and stopping bys. And that's, that's what the majority of the day looked like. And then a portion of that day was um, focused on following up with those and then putting systems in place to do that. You know, today, if, if I'm talking to a new agent, I'm going to say the same thing. Look, you need to spend the vast majority of time on generating business, generating relationships, and meeting people. Now, there's more ways to do it than you have time to do it or, or that you should even try. But pick two or three and get really good at those two or three. Like it might be on, on YouTube. It might be on social media or on, on, on the various platforms. It might be, you might be great face-to-face. -face. It might be, um, you know, at, at live events. It might be on the phone. It might be at the door, whatever it is. Pick two or three and become really proficient at those. And when you do, then add the next ones and the next ones and the next ones. Um, there's also, you know, new agents today have options that new agents back then didn't. It makes me feel old. I keep saying back then. When I was a kid, um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, teams and, and are a great option. You know, right? being able to walk into a, a team environment, the right team, to where they have the systems in place, the structures in place, the machine in place where you can be plugged in to a piece of it and start to be productive right away is a, a great opportunity. Uh, and then there's a lot of platforms now that you can leverage to be able to meet people. Like the agents we deal with at Ojo, you know, one of the biggest values that we provide to the agents and the loan officers that we deal with is we are making new introductions. We're allowing them to build new relationships. Uh, and once they have those relationships, then it's, it's theirs to, to make or break into future business and referral business and, and from there. But, you know, there's a lot of ways to start building relationships. So it, to sum it up, it's making as many, having as many conversations as you can every day, following up with those people with things of value, um, building new relationships, deepening those relationships, and then being the one that's there to, to help them in the time that they need help. Probably do an entire episode just on that. I think we could. I I might I might uh, suggest we do that since we're running short on time. I, I do have a question uh, as it relates to what you just described and 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 knowing pretty well understanding how you did it back then and the argument that I wouldn't say an argument but 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 the debate that I get into an agent who does it the old fashioned way versus the new way. First of all. They work really well in conjunction together. And where I'm going with this is when you start to study, and as you know, with, with what Tristan and I have with Dunk on Social, we've really put a, a strong emphasis on identifying and understanding marketing. Yep. And, and one of the things I've learned is that the best marketers, the best marketing companies are focusing on the next up and coming generation. They're not focused on the generation with money, like the real, most real estate agents are, which is baby boomers and Gen X. And and these companies are focusing on Gen Z, which is which is you know, it took me a minute to understand that. Uh, but as as I as I bring that up, and you you talk about millennials, you talk about Gen Z, which you know you're talking about you know two now generations of potential home buyers that have not bought like any past generations before them. Yeah. And the way they want to transact, the way they want to be communicated with, is changing dramatically. And we really, I don't think we've really fully felt it yet because they're just, they haven't really entered the market like past generations for a lot of reasons, yep. but they don't want you to call them. They don't even want to be texted. Like they want to, they want to be able to build a parasocial relationship with you first, then they'll decide if they're willing. I mean, don't even bring up meeting in person. In fact, it's, it's only going to be a matter of years before we're going to be, you know, augmented reality. We're gonna be holograms in, in our customers' living rooms because they don't want to meet face to face. So as you think about that, what are your thoughts around that? Because you're, you're an OG who did it at the highest level, doing it the way we've been taught for 30, 40 years. And now here are jackasses like me going out and speaking to real estate agents saying, you better start thinking, changing the way you think. 
I'd love to hear what you have to say because I'm I'm pretty sure you probably have some pretty profound thoughts around that. Yeah, look at um to to really see where my mind's at, all you have to do is, you know, follow me on on social media and see I I'm we I, I'm a strong believer in meeting people where they are. Like before the internet, I was I was telling my team this story. Before the internet, I used to go to new home developments, to the model homes because the model homes were filled with buyers and I would meet buyers in these model homes. I said, oh, where are you folks from? And, you know, and oh, yeah, I'm in real estate. I, I, was just, I have some clients who are looking at these homes too. And have you considered resale homes in the area? And next thing you know, they're following me from the new home development to, to look at a home I have around the corner. But I went there because that's where they were. Where are the buyers and sellers now? They're, they're online, they're on all the platforms, they're on TikTok, they're on, you know, they're, they're all the places that, that most of us are, but are, most of us aren't doing things effectively to connect with them. Yeah. So I, I don't care if it was the OG style of connecting with them at their front door or calling them or creating content that has them say, hey, this, this, this guy or this gal is, is I, I can relate to this or I like this or this is funny or I think this is the type of person I want to do business with. You know, and then being able to... Um, you know, to be able to be there and to be able to be responsive in the way they want to respond. Um, you don't need to talk to me about Gen Z and millennials. I have three millennials and one Gen Z. I have four kids between the ages of 23 and 33. Um, I absolutely know how to get them not to respond to me and how to get them to respond. I, it is not uncommon for me to call. I'll be in the car and I don't want to text or message them on a platform or anything else. And I will call. And it's not uncommon for them not to pick up. And then for me to get a text message, you know, a few minutes later, say, what's up? Or what do you need? <laughs> um, and as they're dead, I want to say, I need to talk to you. That's why I called you. Um, but I understand that, right? So um, that's why, you know, people can believe when my, when my youngest daughter, um, oh, I guess this probably would have been 10, 8, 10 years ago when she was on Snapchat, that I was on Snapchat. Because that's how I would communicate with her. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my older ones now on, whether it's on Instagram or stuff, they, they, um, we announced, although I've been the president of Ojo for a couple of months, we announced it publicly yesterday. And, and that was all over social media. And so I get a text message, a group family text message last night from my oldest daughter say, hey, dad. Don't you think you should tell us about promotions and not have us find it out on social media? <laughs> By the way, congratulations, but what the heck? And um, so, yeah, you know, like back to your question, we we have to um, we evolve. And like I think for the most part, agents are doing a pretty darn good job of it. Um, at least most are. And thanks to, you know, look at thanks to you and, and Tristan and people like you that are really educating people on um, you know, what to do. Like it's just being on social media, you, you got to be there, right? That yes, that's a, that is a foundational piece. But what you're doing and how you're doing it is either going to be effective or ineffective. And if you're going to be there and spending time, you want to do things that are being effective and not be wasting time or using it as a distraction or the other things that can very easily become. So having you know, being really purposeful about how we use it, what we're doing, and having a strategy, and then and then just like anything else following that plan and having the discipline to do it and stick to it and 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 not not waver from it so let me ask you on the air are you willing to come back and do a, a second episode ah i'd love to love to i'm not, look at it's um i've been fortunate i've had a lot of a lot of great mentors and coaches in my life and um i really you know operate under that belief of what comes around goes around so if something I say, do, or write about, you know, help someone else, then, then, then it's completely worth it. What I would like to do is, is uh, obviously we'll do a little, a, a little recap here, but, but uh, what I want to do is, is really talk about go deeper on Legion strategies. So we, we spent some time on, on mindset and discipline, which we probably can, can continue to do to a degree, but I really want to get down to that brass tax on on those things that you've done and how you see them evolving, you know. So that is the expireds and the door knocking and those sorts of things. 
uh, Fizbo's, all that, so all that jazz. I also want to, I want to go deeper with you on handwritten notes. I know yeah. how important that was to your business and how you've evolved that. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk more about what you're doing at Ojo and I want to get your thoughts on social and, and, you know, doing things through, yeah, th through the internet, th online, and uh, get your thoughts on where you think things are going. So I just I just laid the foundation for episode number two. So uh, we'll, we'll get that scheduled. Um, it's it's uh, at the time of this recording, it's a Friday afternoon. So I know, you know, you've got guests coming and, and I'm heading out of town. So this has been an awesome conversation. And, and now I get to look forward to the next one. All right. Well, I, I'm looking forward to, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you and your, your audience. Welcome Agents Podcast.